The next topic we're going to look at here in the, our quest to understand the electron structure in atoms is we're going to look at the Schrodinger equation. I have a hard time pronouncing that, but he was a very, very famous, very smart scientist who came up with the equation describing wave motion in all kinds of respects. So here we're taking a simplistic view. We're putting an electron in a box. It moves back and forth. We know that it can exist in certain quantum states defined by the structure of the wave that can exist in a box like that. But then we also realized, or not we, but Schrodinger and some of the smart scientists that lived at the same time, realized that if we took the wave equation that we have here and we squared, because this wave equation describes, of course, the wave structure of the, uh, of the electrons existing in a box like that, but it, they realized that if we square this equation, square the wave function, we now come up with a probability density function that describes the probability of finding the electron. And notice that if an electron is in its lowest energy state, n equals one state, and we know that the wave would look like this, what that means is that the electron is most probable existing right at the halfway point between the two ends of the box and has zero probability of, exist of existing right at the very edge of the box. If the electron jumps to the next energy level, n equals 2, and the wave looks like this, it, we can then determine that the electron has the highest probability of existing right here at the antinodes of the wave, and zero probability at the nodes of the wave, and so forth. So we see this pattern right there. And this pattern right here, the probability density, can be found by simply squaring the wave function. And really, the wave function itself doesn't really truly describe the existence of where the electron is at at all times. It simply says it helps us understand from a mathematical perspective how, how an electron, being a very small particle and acting like a wave, can exist inside a box, confined by the box. But if we square that wave function, we now actually have something we can sink our teeth into. We can actually determine the probability of where that electron will be at any point in time. And that's really what will define the structure of an atom and where the electrons will be because where the electrons are placed in the orbitals is simply defined by the probability where we're most likely to find them. And so the structure of these orbitals will be defined by the wave function squared. That's why we have to understand what that really means. Now, also we realize that, of course, there's a 100% probability that the electron will be somewhere from the left end of the box to the right end of the box obviously. So if we sum up all the probabilities where the electron can be, it'll be equal to 1 or 100 percent. But what if we want to know what the probability is for the electron to exist in this small region right there, from this position right there to a little bit further to the right? In other words, what is the probability that the electron will exist somewhere between x and x plus delta x in that very small region? What we have to do then is take the probability density, which is equal to the function, the wave function squared, times the, the width of that region, and that will tell us the probability of the electron being right there. And of course, if we then sum them all up, the probability should add up to 100% or 1, and that's where this equation comes from. Now, that means that we can also use that principle to figure out the amplitude of our wave function. Now, again, there's no such thing as an electron having a physical amplitude as it moves around an, an atom or when it moves inside a box, but at least to come up with a good Schrodinger equation for a particle in a box like this, we need to be able to define A. And now that we have the probability density function right here, we're able to figure that out. So, first what we're going to do is square both sides. So we have the square of the function is equal to A squared times the sine squared of N pi X over L, like that, that's the angle. That, of course, depends on the quantum state n of the electron, and l being the size of the box, and x being the position inside the box of the electron. Then we realize that if we take the integral of that, and we square that times the x, that has to equal 1, which means that it's equal to a squared times the sine squared of n pi x over l times dx. Since we know this is equal to 1, we can actually solve for that. And of course, we're supposed to sum that up from 0 to L, right, over the entire length of the box. So we can't forget our limits like that. So now we realize that if we work this out, we'll be able to figure out a value for A. The integral of the sine squared, for those who don't remember, integral of sine squared, let's say of u, is equal to 1 half of u minus 1 quarter the sine of 2u, double the angle. 
So we need to make the proper substitution here. So if we let u equal to n pi x over l, then du dx is equal to n pi over l, which means that dx is going to be equal to, well, actually, I'm trying to skip a step here, but I probably shouldn't. So then we can say that uh, du is equal to n pi over l dx, or dx is equal to l over n pi times du. So now we have a substitution for u, and we have, this, oh, this is l right there, and we have the substitution for dx. And if we plug that in here, let's see what we get. So 1 is equal to, I can pull the a squared out, so this is a squared times the integral from 0 to l, and of course these are x limits, these are not u limits, uh, of the sine squared of u, and dx is going to be l over n pi times du. So bringing that out, because n pi and l are constants, we can bring that out, so we have 1 is equal to a squared times l divided by n pi times the integral from 0 to l of the sine squared of u du. And of course, when we have our integral right there, we can go ahead and solve that. So we have 1 is equal to a squared l over n pi times, that would be, uh, as we can see, 1 half u minus 1 quarter the sine of 2u. If we now plug in back what those are equal to, because u is equal to n pi x over l, so let's go ahead and do that. So now we have 1 is equal to a squared l over n pi times 1 half, and u was n pi x over l minus 1 quarter the sine of 2 that, 2 times that, that would be 2n pi x over l evaluated from 0 to l. So now we can apply our limits, because now we get our original variables back. Notice though, if you plug in 0 here, the sine of 0 is 0, and if you plug in l in here, l divided by l is 1, and 2 pi times an integer number, well if you take the sine of 2 pi, we also get 0, so this term here drops out and becomes 0. If you plug in 0 in this term right here, plug in 0 for x, that goes to 0. So the only thing we have to do is plug in an l here and see what we get. So 1 is equal to a squared l over n pi times 1 half n pi l over l. The l's cancel out. The n pi's cancel out. And so we're left with 1 is equal to a squared l over 2. We're almost there. I can then see that a squared is equal to 2 divided by l by moving the 2 to the other side and moving the l to the other side and then taking the square roots. Yes! We can then say that a is equal to the square root of 2 over l. So Schrodinger went to the exact same calculation, most likely, and this and many others, and determined by finding the probability density function, he can then go ahead and plug this value back in for a, and that means he came up with all this, he came up with the wave function for an electron in a box, or a small particle like an electron in a box, is equal to the square root of 2 over L times the sine of n pi x over L. And this then became the true equation determined by Schrodinger describing the particle motion in a box and the wave function of the box. So if we now take the, if we now square this function like this, we now can come up with the function describing the probability of where the electron will exist. If we square this function, we will then come up with these particular graphs for the probability of where the electron can exist. And we'll go ahead and show you how we use that equation in the future to describe how electrons exist in the orbitals of the atom.